Uh, first thing I want to say is if you are a guest, uh, we haven't uh, mentioned this in a while, we do have these uh, guest cards. Um, if you would mind filling one of those out and putting them in one of the boxes we have uh, between these uh, boxes at the near these center doors and then at the top of the stairs um, in the balcony. Um, if you wouldn't mind filling those out, we'd love to connect with you and answer any questions you might have. But also on the back uh, for any of us, if you have a prayer requests, please put those on there. We would love to pray for those things. Those are, we take those things very seriously. A um, couple of announcements we have coming up. Um, first of all, this Wednesday, this Wednesday, our Wednesday night activities start back up. But this week is a little bit different. We're calling this week, this uh, this Wednesday night, August 31st, um, 5.30, we, uh, it will be um, family night. And so we're just asking you to come, um, come and have uh, dinner with us, hang out with us. We're going to get some information. We want to make sure that we have good um, addresses and phone numbers for all the kids that are going to come and be a part of things so that we can communicate with them throughout the year. Um, and also, it's a chance for us to just uh, talk a little bit about what our church has going on for families. So please come for that. Um, if uh, we would, uh, if you'd like to come and help serve the meal, clean up, any of those kinds of things, those things are always um, needed and welcome. Um, and then on top of that, if you know people that are going to be a part of this, we have uh, notes going home, information going out. But please let people know what we have going on, that this is a meal for the whole family. And so uh, please invite them to come and be a part of that. And then next Sunday, next Sunday is all family foundations. Um, so Labor Day weekend, next Sunday morning. Instead of going to your normal foundations classes, um, if you have kids or um, you are a grandparent and you're involved in your, your grandkids' lives, those kinds of things, um, I'm going to be teaching the Sunday school lesson going through um, all of our... Uh, uh, the guide that we put together for families uh, throughout the week, all those kinds of things in the fellowship hall. Um, if you are not involved in a grandkid's life or something like that, then Michael will be teaching um, a Sunday school class in the chapel. And so that's going to be a great time. Please come for that. And again, invite families to come and be a part of that and see how we're trying to... said. Um, also, don't forget, we have the marbles outside uh, right by the bathrooms. There's a prayer, um, Bible, and conversation uh, marbles. If your family is participating, if you prayed three times this week, put a, you put a red marble in. If you read the Bible two times this week, you put a blue marble in, uh, or no, a green marble in. Uh, if you had a faith conversation this week, you put a green marble in. This just helps us all to be able to see what our, what our families are doing and how we're investing in the next generation's lives. So with all that being said, we have a special guest today to come and open our service. So we have Albert, a, a family friend of uh, uh, of the Duggins, and so I'm going to invite Albert to come up and open our service in a few words in prayer. Thank you so much. Good morning. Well, we got a few good mornings out there. Good morning. Hey, y'all did a lot better. If we did three times, no telling what it was. We're not going to push my luck. It's good to be here this morning. We had the opportunity of sharing with the chapel class some about uh, what we do. I've been a dentist for many, many years. Along with that, I've had the opportunity to do medical missions to share the gospel around the world, and uh, it's been a joy uh, in doing that. We've probably had the opportunity to share in all, all the continents uh, sometime or another, and I just uh, basically as a dentist, I just go in and I'll tell the class, I'm the hook. I'm the hook. How many of you people out here are fishermen? We got any fishermen out here? Got one fisherman on that. Well, basically, the hook gets the fish there, and I'm as a dentist, I go to, they come to get their teeth taken care of, but the more important part that to do is to share Jesus Christ with them and hopefully give them an eternal life on that. So Kathy, my wife, and I have been the opportunity to, to go to a lot of different countries. I won't try to list them all off, uh, but uh, it's, it's a joy to do that. So with that, let's talk to God. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for being our Lord and our God and for loving us, caring for us, and look at ours. Thank you for the instructions to pray. Thank you for commandments to pray. Not just instructions, commandments to pray. And we pray that uh, during this time that our minds will be open to you, 
Daddy, that you will nudge us where we need to be nudged and lift us up. Thank you for this church and the history it has of sharing Jesus Christ in this community. And may it continue to do so in even a more vibrant way uh, to lift up Jesus Christ. Thanks for each individual here that they may uh, be sensitive to what you have to say today. And uh, throughout the day that they can glorify you in each and everything they do. God, thank you for being our Lord and our God. And we love you so much. In precious name, amen. Good morning. Thank you so much. Let's all stand and praise our wonderful Savior. to be able to have so many people to fill in with for us, and we appreciate Pastor Michael coming and helping us out this morning. Um, so, we appreciate you being patient with us as well. So, uh, we're going to, I'm going to give it a shot and play piano for y'all today, too. <laughs> we're all 
in this together, praising Jesus no matter what, even the clunkers. Your 
Great job, y'all. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Y'all sound wonderful out there, too. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turn. Thy faith. 
we just praise your name today, Lord, even though when we're learning new things, Lord, we praise your new we praise your name. And dear Lord, we pray for Michael as he comes and he preaches your word. Lord, let us listen to what you have to say through him. Let us open our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. I'm going to read from... Mark chapter 13. Actually, I'm not reading from Mark chapter 13. I'm reading Mark chapter 13. So flip there, if you would, stand as we read God's word. So Mark chapter 13. Mark 13. As he was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Do you see all these great buildings, replied Jesus? Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the temple, opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us when these things will happen and what will be the sign that they are all about to be fulfilled. And Jesus said to them, watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming I am he and will deceive many. When you heard of wars, when you hear of rumors of... Uh -huh, when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of birth pains. You must be on your guard. You will be handed over to the, you will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues on account of me. You will stand before governors and kings as witness to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, don't worry before about what to say. Just say whatever is given to you at the time. For it is not in you it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother to death, and father his child. Children rebel against their parents and have them put to death. All men will hate you because of me, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you see the abomination that causes desolation standing where it does not belong, let the reader understand. Then let those who are are in Judea, flee to the mountains. Let no one on the roof of his house go down or enter the house to take anyone out. Let no one in the field go back to his, get his cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that this will not take place in the winter because those, who, because those will be days of distress unequaled from the beginning when God created the world until now and never be equaled again. If the Lord had not cut short those days, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, whom he has chosen, he has shortened them at the time, at that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it, for false Christ and false prophets will appear and perform signs and miracles to deceive the elect, if that were possible, so be on your guard, I have told you everything ahead of time, but in those days, following that distress, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken, at that time, Men will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory, and he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Now, learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is, that it is near, right at the door. I tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with his assigned task, and tells one, the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch before, keep watch because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back whether in the evening or at midnight, or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. 
Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you loved us enough to tell us beforehand what, what the end will look like. Father, I pray that as we live our lives before you, we live lives with integrity of heart, Lord, always being ready for you to return. Father, I pray that we would all live a life that's ready every day to either die or to see you come back and take us. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to live that way, integrity of heart before you, a way that's pleasing to you, that our lives would honor you. And, Father, we love you. And we say, come, Lord Jesus, in your name, amen. I'll tell you that the reason why I even picked up the guitar was in my first church, there was no one to play the guitar. And I can sit here and say to all you guys, you know, sometimes you got to step out and do things for the Lord that you're not comfortable with. And I thought, well, why not me? And Andy's dad is a great guitarist, and he gave me a little guitar, and I started playing, and, and uh, just so I could help the church. So maybe that's a testimony for some of you guys thinking, well, I don't know if I know how to play the guitar or whatever, and I didn't either. And I was an adult when I learned, and haven't learned well. I haven't played a lot here lately since I've been here, uh, but maybe that's just hopefully maybe some encouragement for you that if the pastor can do it, anybody can do it, right? And so step up, and Julie stepping up on the piano, that was uncomfortable for her, so both of us, you know, I know you saw me stop two or three times, I was sweating so bad I couldn't hold my pick, it kept sliding out because I was nervous, and I know she was nervous, but we are proud of her too for stepping up and maybe trying something hard, something that you may not be comfortable with, but you know that it'll help the church, so Take that for what it's worth. And then the second thing that's hard today for me, that was hard for me to do this morning, but we're going to preach about the end times. So I'm just doing two hard things uh, this morning. And uh, as you know, we've been working through the Gospel of Mark, and uh, we've gotten into that last section where Jesus is in Jerusalem. These last few chapters are centered around Jesus and uh, primarily, you know, his confrontation with the religious establishment. We've been talking a lot about that the last several weeks. And now that's come to a close, and we're going to see in these last few chapters Jesus investing in and talking to his disciples, preparing them, helping them get ready for uh, what's to come. And so he gives them this kind of great uh, revelation, this great proclamation of, of what they can expect as believers uh, moving forward. And uh, the passage is often called uh, the Olivet Discourse because, um, you know, Jesus spent some time there in the temple confronting the scribes, the Pharisees, those things like that. And when they had given up uh, trying to trap him, it says he and his disciples leave the temple and they go down through the uh, Kidron Valley and then they end up there on the Mount of Olives. And so they're able to overlook Jerusalem and the temple. And so he's sitting out and visiting with them. Uh, And uh, this is one of probably one of the more complicated passages that we'll see here in Mark, but also uh, it's complicated because it's, you know, talking about the end times. Uh, There may not be any other types of literature uh, that cause a lot of fascination and are more difficult than, you know, passages about the end times or apocalyptic literature. Um, The word apocalypse or apocalyptic uh, just means to reveal or to make known. And so there's sections of scripture that reveal or, or make known uh, the, the future events, these things that we have to look forward to uh, in the end times. You have larger apocalyptic pieces of literature in Daniel and, of course, the whole book of Revelation, but there's smaller pieces of apop- apocalyptic, apocalyptic uh, literature here, like this one chapter in the Gospel of Mark. And so, as I said, uh, there may not be uh, any types of Scripture that cause more interest uh, in the lives of people, uh, you know, there's been tons of books, movies made, and even whole ministries dedicated uh, to, you know, the apocalypse, the end times. And it's, it's inevitable that anytime I, you know, I go to a new church or if I go do a new Bible study or whatever it is, whenever I move into a new group of people, uh, it doesn't take long before someone asks me, what are your views of the end times? And I'm a little snarky and, I, and I'll have all kinds of weird answers uh, you know, one would be Hugh. Many of you, uh, sometimes we miss Hugh's guitar up here, and, you know, he was great. I'm not great. Y'all have me now. So anyway, uh, but Hugh was a ardent student of the end times. He loved studying the end times and working through different books and things like that. And I remember whenever you had called me to be your pastor, and there's that in-between time where I'm 
you know, closing down things over there and then transitioning over here. And so Hugh and I started talking on the phone pretty regularly uh, during that transition just to prepare to get to know one another, kind of get things on the calendar for after I get here. And, and man, it didn't take many phone calls before Hugh wanted to discuss the end times and my views. And he said something along the lines of, man, I hope you don't hold it against me, but I'm a post-tribulation person. And some of you know what that means and some of you don't. And if you want to know more, you can ask me. Kim's over there with bated breath, like, let's talk about this stuff. Kim loves it too. Uh, but he says, man, I hope you don't hold it against me, but I'm a post-tribulation you know, person. And I said, well, that's awesome, Hugh. I hope you don't hold it against me that I don't care. I mean, and he laughed. If you know Hugh, he just giggled. He thought that was the funniest thing in the whole world. And, uh, and the reason why we could both laugh about that is that this is one of the things that, because even though it's so popular, there's not a lot of clarity. There's not a lot of clarity in this apoc- apocalyptic, I can't say that word today. I'm just going to say apocalyptic. How about that? I'll just coin a new word today. There's not enough clarity in this apocalyptic literature to really be certain. There's, there's symbols, and there's not really a lot of agreement about what these symbols mean, and there's all kinds of different ideas and ways to interpret uh, this end times theology. And so Hugh and I just laugh because we know that doesn't really matter. I mean, there are some doctrines that are non-negotiable, right? We have to adhere to the authority of Scripture for faith and practice. There's no other authority in our life other than Scripture. We have to hold to the sufficiency of Christ for salvation. We have to hold to faith alone in Christ as the means of salvation. And there's another handful of doctrines that we have to hold very closely, and we're not even Christians. We can't be brothers and sisters on some of those doctrines. But like the doctrine of the end times, we can hold very open-handedly. We could be, you know, very good brothers and sisters in Christ and even be on the same staff and not have agreement about how the end times views all play out. We just hold that open-handed and we can joke about it. We can laugh about it. And I kind of really had dedicated myself to never preach about the end times. I mean, it was just something I had dedicated myself to. People have asked me, have you gone through Revelation? And in 20 years of the ministry, I have not. I've read it and the Bible says, you know, it's, you're blessed if you read it. And so there you go. I've checked my box, but I haven't taught it. Uh, but here it is in Mark. So we're going to have to talk about it a little bit, you know, and we're going to hopefully the thing that we're going to understand too, is I'm not going to answer all your questions today. It's just impossible uh, you know, I'm a sermon junkie, and I like to listen to other people, and some people broke this chapter into three chapters, five sermons, three sermons, stuff like that, and I'm just going to do it in one. So we're going to hit the highlights. If it prompts more discussion, you can come to our weekends. Tonight's a weekend. We can talk more about it tonight, and I'll tell you there, I don't really care, right? But we'll talk about it, and we'll have a lot of fun, and we'll, there's three or four primary views. We can talk about all of those things and, and uh, see where you come down, and we can have a lot of fun with it. But I think the first thing we need to do is spend just a few moments kind of eating our vegetables, right? Sometimes you have to eat your vegetables before you can have the dessert, is that there's some theological issues that I think are important for us to begin to to understand and to interpret this apocalyptic literature in the scriptures, and it really kind of revolves around the nature of prophecy. So the first thing I want to do is spend a moment uh, talking about prophecy in general, whether it be just kind of the general prophecy we see in the Old Testament or apocalyptic prophecy that we see here in this particular passage. Uh, Prophecy is another one of those issues that gets quite a bit of attention, and depending on where you've gone to church and what traditions you've been a part of, there's differing views about prophecy, and is it, you know, gone with the apostles? Does it still exist as an office? Um, Can you prophesy over people? I remember um, when I was leading the school for a while, we met in a more charismatic church. We borrowed their building, and one day, a bunch of ladies came and, and said, hey, can we pray for you? And I said, that's awesome. He said, we're going to prophesy over you first. And they said all these prophecies over me about how I was going to be successful and rich and all these things. And I thought, man, if this is what prophecy is, I want to be a part of that, right? And, and I don't really hold to that. I hold to maybe a, a more simple understanding of prophecy because prophecy in its boast, boast. I mean, you know, I'm so rattled from trying to play the guitar, I'm not going to be able to talk. So the most broad strokes, basic meaning of prophecy is just proclaiming the Word of God. So does prophecy is still exist today? In that context, yeah, it does. That anytime someone gets up and declares a word from Scripture, from God, then that's a, a prophetic uh, proclamation that you're, you're, you're saying the words of God to uh, His people. And so much of what I do, even on a Sunday morning, is a prophetic utterance because I'm, I'm proclaiming the Word of God uh, to, you, to you guys. And so 
uh, you know, there's truths and there's uh, all kinds of things in Scripture that God has revealed to us that we proclaim, and that's prophecy. The vast majority of what we see, even in the Old Testament, is that type of prophecy, just declaring the Word of God. So you see, you know, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Micah, Nahum, the rest, you know, when they're, they're prophesying, most of the time, they're just declaring, thus said the Lord. This is what the Lord has said, right? And a lot of times, what they are declaring or what we read in Deuteronomy chapter 28, you know, a lot of you know, Old Testament prophecy comes from uh, these promises in Deuteronomy chapter 28. So we know that through Exodus and then, then again in Deuteronomy, God gives us His Word. He gives us His law. He gives us His, you know, character, nature, heart. There's all kinds of things to say about the law, but, but that's revealed to the people of God uh, through Scripture. Then there at the end of Deuteronomy, uh, there's these promises that say, if you obey the law, if you obey these commands that I've given to you, you will prosper. But if you don't obey, if you're walking in disobedience, that you're, you're going to be going to be punished, right? And so if you obey, this is a, you know, kind of a quick summary of Deuteronomy 28. You know, if you obey and keep the commandments, you're going to have victory over your armies, you're going to have abundance in your crops, and your wives will probably have lots of children. So that's what Deuteronomy, so keep the law and you will be blessed. But it also goes on to say if you walk in disobedience, you're not going to have abundance in your crops, and you're probably not going to have victory over your enemies. You're, you could be barren, and ultimately you're going to end up in exile. So that's Deuteronomy 28. So then what you see later is all the prophets coming back saying, remember, remember, God has told us what to do. God has told us how to live. He has given us his statutes and his commands, and he's called us to live by them. And remember, if you don't live by them, you will be punished. Therefore, repent. So most of the prophets are calling Israel to repent. They begin to wander. They begin to, to disobey, and they're, they're calling their attention back to the commands of God and just calling them to repent. That's what we see primarily in prophecy. And I thought about it this way with my kids, right? We do our best, all of us do, uh, to teach our kids to behave correctly. Here's the law of dad, whatever that is, right? And if I'm doing it right, I'm just kind of mimicking uh, the law that's in the Bible, right? This is what you should do. You should be honest. You should be kind. You know, you don't be a bully. All of these things are trying to teach our kids, and they're little. They're, they're their only friends, and most of the behavior ha- happens just with them together. And so, hey, act right. Things will go good. Maybe we'll get some ice cream in a bit. Don't act right. You're going to get the spoon. I don't know about you guys, but we had a big wooden spoon. It's still there in the crock thing that has all the utensils that you could pull that out. It had a little nice rubber handle on it, and you can give them a pretty good spank with that spoon. And so, obey, ice cream, disobey, you're going to get the spoon, right? It's simple. But there would be times, you know, they're out playing in the yard or in their room or whatever, and they're doing good. They're playing well. They're laughing. They're giggling. I've often said, man, there's just no better sound than hearing your children laugh and giggle, right? You know, Annie and I sit on the couch and listen to them back in the room giggling for hours. It's just a lot of fun. And there's times where they're just doing the right thing, and it's fruitful for them, right? But then there's times you start to hear the bickering, the kind of competitiveness with each other. You start hearing the complaining, and so I might call one of them out. I'm not going to signal, you know, signal one of them out. But I might call one and say, hey, come here. You, not, you need to go back and, and remind your siblings of the law, the law of dad, right? You need to go back and remind them that if they keep acting this way, I'm going to have to come in with the spoon. But if you get your act together and start acting better, then things are going to be good. So the person who goes back in to the other siblings and says, hey, dad says we need got to cut it out, right? If we don't cut it out, he's going to come in with the spoon. Well, occasionally, they didn't cut it out. Occasionally, they would continue to act up. And five or 10 or 15 minutes later, I'd come in with the spoon and say, hey, I told y'all, right? If you don't behave, you're going to have to get the spoon. And the other kids just didn't bow down and say, oh, you must be a prophet of God. Ten minutes ago, you said dad was going to come in here and spank us, and now he's here spanking us. You must be from God. No, that's not how prophecy works, right? They're not just like seeing into the future and, and, and coming up with these things that miraculously happen. They're just proclaiming what God has already said. They're, they're, they're proclaiming the words of God that have been revealed, and they've, they're calling people to, to obedience and to repentance and to remember the beauty of God and why he's worth following. That's what most of prophecy is. But, you know, there are times when we have to acknowledge there is a bit of prophecy, and it's a small percentage. Uh, I heard in seminary, it's about 5%. About 5% of prophecy is saying something specific about the future, right? Because you can say very broadly, hey, if you don't get your act together, God's going to punish you, right? That's true, because God says that. You're seeing God's own words after him. But sometimes, very specifically, it would be something on the lines of, 
if you don't get your act together, we're going to be in Babylon for 70 years, right? It's very specific. There's some future elements of what they're saying there. We also see some positive future elements, right? That because I'm a loving God and because you're my people, I am going to send you a, a, a king. We've been talking about that all the way through uh, the gospel of Mark, that Jesus has come to usher in the kingdom of God, that he's going to be the the, the, the final king in the line of David who's going to establish order and peace for the nations. And so there's prophecy in the Old Testament that says your king is going to be born in Bethlehem. He's going to be born of a virgin, right? There's these things that we see that are very, very specific about how this future is going to unfold. But that's a very small percentage. Most of the time, it was something along the lines of, you better get your act together because God has already told you what to do. And if you don't, he's going to come back and punish you, right? So that's kind of a nature of prophecy that we need to understand to understand this apocalyptic literature. But secondly, again, doing a little bit more eating our vegetables. Another thing that we need to understand about prophecy is sometimes it has, uh, Richard Phillips calls it, a, a telescoping uh, element to it. That a, a, a prophecy, you know, a declaration from a prophet uh, will often, most of the time, have a very immediate fulfillment. But that immediate fulfillment is a foreshadowing of or a type of a longer, larger, more far off, ultimate fulfillment. One example would be 2 Samuel chapter 2. Uh, Phillips gave us this example. I was going to look at some others, but this one's pretty easy. Uh, the Lord comes to David in 2 Samuel chapter 2 and tells him that he's not going to build the temple, but it's going to be his son who's going to build the temple, right? And we know that that's what happened. We know that immediately, you know, in in, in and when I say immediately, we know it might have been several years, but in the scope of history, very quickly, Solomon does build uh, this temple, and it's a temple that, uh, you know, becomes a place where God's presence can, could dwell with his people, and people could come to the temple and worship and offer their sacrifices, and it became the very center point of their whole religious life uh, was to come to this temple, and so God tells David that your son is going to build the temple. But later on in that same passage, it goes on to say that your son's kingdom will never come to an end, and it will last forever. Well, we know this can't be talking about Solomon, because Solomon didn't last forever, right? His kingdom did come to an end. And so we can see a, a longer, more permanent fulfillment that happens in the future, and ultimately, we know, again, looking at it from our side of history, that God is telling David that there's going to be one who's not going to just come and build a temple, but there's going to be one who's going to come and be the temple. And he's going to be the place where the, the, the people could be reconnected with God and dwell with God and offer their worship to God. So there was an immediate fulfillment of that prophecy, but there was a later, more full fulfillment of that prophecy that this first one points to. It foreshadows. It's a type. And we can talk about that for a long time. In fact, I just took a whole class about all of this. That may be why I'm saying so much about it. I don't know. But that gets us to our passage today. Because here's a prophecy. Here's an apocalyptic prophecy. Jesus is talking about what's going to happen. And he's talking about what they can expect as they move into the future. And we have to understand that there are this, this telescoping principles or elements in this particular prophecy, that there's going to be some very immediate fulfillment uh, to this prophecy, but there's also far-off fulfillment. There's more ultimate fulfillment to these prophecies, and it's very difficult. You know, one thing about apoc apocalyptic literature, and some of the Bible in general, it, it's just hard. It's, it, it's very difficult, and I think that's why we see such a divergence of views and ideas about what do these things really mean? What can we take away from these things? Because they can be difficult. And in this particular passage in Mark chapter 13, the reason why this apocalyptic literature is so difficult is because you really see three separate things kind of intertwined. You see the, the immediate prophecy about what's going to happen right then and there to these people sitting in front of them, right? Because he said in verse 30, I didn't put all the verses up because I'm just going to paraphrase for the sake of time. Verse 30 he says, you know, none of you are going to pass away until all of this happens. You know, this generation is not going to pass away until all of this takes place. So you know that there's some things happening in this chapter that are immediate. They're going to be fulfilled right now. But there's also some things that are going to be fulfilled later, at the end. When all of this comes to a halt, there's things that are going to happen that are going to be fulfilled. But there's also represented in this passage kind of this in-between. What's going to happen in between this time when the, the prophecy is immediately fulfilled and a time when it's going to be ultimately fulfilled. There's a time in there. So let's just kind of talk about all of these things. So first, you know, as Jesus, again, takes his disciples, they've been in the temple, 
uh, for several days. We know that the last probably six chapters of Mark happened over a one-week period. And so a lot of this stuff that's happened over the last several chapters has just been, you know, Jesus in the temple the majority of these days leading up to his uh, betrayal and resurrection. And so they leave the temple. As I said a moment ago, they go down to Kidron Valley. They go up to the Mount of Olives. But as they're leaving, what's the discussion? It's about the temple. And so Jesus prophesies very quickly in this passage, you know, these stones. The apostle says, look at these stones. Aren't they magnificent? Um, in, in fact, one author said that, you know, these stones there in the temple uh, were often 37 feet long by 12 feet high by 18 feet deep. So you can just imagine, just, it was a, a, a sight to behold. You know, the temple was breathtaking. It was beautiful. People put, you know, a, you know according to God's purposes or his instructions, there's a lot of care and, and, and beauty into the temple, and they're leaving it, and they say, man, isn't this awesome, especially these stones? And Jesus immediately says, you know, look at these stones. There's not going to be one stone left on top of another, right? He's prophesying immediately about the destruction of the temple, that this, this thing that they had revered had become the center point of all of their religion was going to be dismantled. Every single stone was not going to be left on top of the other. And then Jesus goes on, and there's elements to this passage that are talking about right now, that this is happening right now. You need to get ready. And he goes on to say, um, there's going to be others who are going to rise up to be a Messiah. Well, we know that in the first century, there's all kinds of Messiah figures who rose up and said, I'm the one. And we know that the reason why they rejected Jesus is because Jesus came in in peace and, and lowliness where they were expecting a Messiah that was going to rally the troops and, and be you know, a military might that was going to push Israel out. There was many who rose up, and that's what he says in this passage. There's going to be many who come in my name and say they're the Messiah. He says there's going to be rumors of war. Well, of course, that was the culture they lived in, this rumor of war. You know, Rome is, imp- is, is uh, oppressing us. And we talked before about how there was this zealot party, the sect of Israelites who, who were, were militant, and they wanted to, whatever means possible, push Rome out. So there was rumors of war and, and rumors with war with Rome. And then Jesus goes on to say that when you see these things, it's time to flee. He says you need to go to the mountains. And we'll be it if you're pregnant, you know, and hopefully it doesn't happen in winter. A.D. 70 happened. All of these things came packed. Some of it's already happened. In A.D. 70, uh, you can recall uh, that, again, I talked about the zealots a moment ago. We've talked about them a little bit through this series, is that in A.D. 70, well, actually in A.D. 66, uh, the zealots rise up, and they do mobilize an army, and they do push Rome out of Israel or out of Jerusalem. And they do, for a moment, establish themselves, again, as the, the governing authorities. But it didn't take long for Rome to regroup and come in and in AD 70 utterly destroy Jerusalem and the temple. There was literally no stone left on top of the other. Uh, people have written about how the gold and all those things, because they were burning it with fire, were falling in the cracks, and so the soldiers were just prying stones off of one another to be able to get the gold out. So literally, Jesus told them, there's going to be no stone left on top of another. And it happened. There's this immediate um, fulfillment of these prophecies. And he's warning these people is that you, you know, again, what's another place he says in Scripture? If you live by the sword, you're going to die by the sword. He's warning these people that, you know, his kingdom is not a mighty kingdom. His kingdom is not a warrior kingdom. His kingdom is dealing with more things than just establishing a civil government on the earth, and you need to be careful because you can't live up to Rome. If you push Rome, they're going to crush you. That's what he's teaching them. And he says, and there's going to be birth pains, and you're going to see things rise up, and when that happens, you better flee. And Richard Phillips says, you know, one of the applications would be, you know, it's okay to flee persecution. You know, we don't experience that in our life here, uh, like we do see in other places in the world. We'll talk about that in a moment, but it's okay to flee, to flee persecution. But another, I think, immediate application for us is it shows us that what Jesus says does come true. Rather, Jesus is a person of his word. He makes promises, but he also points out that when we fall short, there is going to be consequences. We talked about how when Jesus came into town, um, he was riding on a, you know, the donkey, and they were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then he immediately goes into the temple. He, he, he withers the fig tree 
turns the tables over, and these are all acts of judgment. He is coming to declare judgment on Israel because we know that Israel did not do the thing that they were called to do, that they were ordained to do. We've talked before that, that Israel as a nation, as a people under God's reign and rule, from the very beginning, back in Genesis, were called to be a light to the world. They were called to be a light to the nations through, through their love of one another and the way they treated each other under the instructions of the law, you know, lovingly and graciously, and how you took care of one another and how you worshiped, that they were supposed to be a light to the nations, and they were also supposed to be a place where the whole world could come and be made right with God through making you know, sacrifices there at the temple. And Israel failed. Israel failed in the one thing that they were called to do, which is to be a light to the nations and, and to be a... I mean, from the beginning, God was telling Israel, he declares the same thing, and the judgment happens. Israel is dismantled. Their whole religious system is dismantled. They're receiving the judgment that, that Jesus had declared onto them when he had come to, that, come to town. So in God's redemptive plan that was started before the beginning of time, Israel failed, became inward focused, became very selfish, hungry for wealth and prosperity, hungry for national acclaim, all of those things. But then God sent Jesus Christ to fulfill all that Israel failed to do. And now when we come to Christ because of his perfect obedience and he, he, he died on the cross for our sin and he raised it up to, to usher us into a new way of living, a new way of being. This, this new redemptive plan is now established in Christ and those who follow him. Right? That's the, the, the immediate application is that because Israel failed to be who they were called to be, the, the light to the nations and the people who, who, who opened up the door to be made right with God, that was passed from Israel to us. And judgment is coming. I think that's a big part of this apocalyptic literature is judgment is coming. If God judged Israel for not doing what they were called to be, why would he not judge us, right? And we'll talk about why he doesn't because he doesn't. But judgment is coming. And I think that's the, the first application. And what he's telling here is now there's no longer a need for this temple. You know, this temple that was the center of their religious life, this temple that is the place that people would come and worship and bring their sacrifices is no longer needed because now we have Jesus. Jesus is the one who's fulfilled what Israel was called to do, and he's become uh, the new temple, the place where people hear the gospel and can be made right with God and have their sins atoned for. So that's kind of the, the first thing that we see woven through this, and I didn't get into all of the language that, that talked about it because of time, but the second thing is that we do see in these events here in first century Palestine as a foreshadowing or a type of a future judgment. Right? There is going to be a time when not only Israel is going to be judged, but the rest of the world is going to be judged. I say this often, that the whole Bible is just, it's unfolding and it's, and it's pointing to a logical conclusion. It's pointing to a time where sin is finally going to be dealt with. It's pointing to a time where Christ is going to come back and defeat his enemies, and he's going to defeat sin and death for us. So these events in 70 AD are a, are a type or foreshadowing of the final destruction of this sinful world and the ushering in of the fullness of the kingdom of God. You know, that's been another theme, kind of keeping it all into context. You know, the kingdom of God is being brought in by Jesus, and, and there's going to be a time where we no longer live in this kind of dual reality. We've talked about that a lot. And as I give my life to Christ, and I surrender my heart and mind to the, the reigning rule of Christ, that as I become a part of his you know, family, I become a part of his kingdom. So the kingdom of God exists now on the earth in the hearts of men and women who have turned their life over to Jesus. And as we come together as a community, we exhibit the virtues, the ethics of the kingdom of God in the way that we love each other, and all of those things that we see in the scripture. But we also know there is much of this world that is not surrendered to Christ and his purposes. There's still a kingdom of the world. There's a kingdom of, you know, that's ruled by the prince of the power of the air. There's this dueling realities that we can live in the kingdom of God, but we're still surrounded by the kingdom of the world. And there's going to be a day, and this passage is pointing to that time when Jesus is going to come back and finally and ultimately do away with the kingdom of the world and forever from then on, fully and ultimately usher in the kingdom of God. And that's what we see in here. There's, there's end times at the end language. He says there, in those days, 
there will be such tribulation as never seen before. And he says, and if the Lord doesn't cut short the days, no human would be saved. He said, the sun is going to be darkened, the moon won't give off light, and the stars will fall from the sky. So you can see intermixed with that language about immediate prophecy of Rome crushing Israel, there's also this language about something that's happening far off, something that's going to come in the future. And, and, and a lot of it is it's things that we can't understand. And there's these signs and these birth pains uh, alluding to the falling of kingdoms and nations and that Jesus is going to establish his kingdom forever. This leads me to the third thing that I want to say and I want to focus on primarily in the moments we have left. This is where I may diverge from some. But I think a lot of this apocalyptic language about the end is really describing what it means to live in between. How there's going to be a time where the sun and the fall is going to, the, the, the sun and the moon is going to fall, right? There's going to be <coughs> maybe a um, ramping up of tribulation to such that no one has ever seen before, right? There might be some of that. And there, and there, and there might be... Um, Oh, what's the third thing I was going to say there? Anyway, but I think a lot of that is not only describing what's going to happen at the very end. It's describing what we have to expect here in the middle. Between when Jesus came and, and, and defeated sin and defeated death and, and, and ushered in his spiritual kingdom and that time where he's going to come and, and usher in his physical king. What is that going to look like? And it's all intertwined here, but some of that language of Christians that are going to be delivered up to councils, and they're going to be beaten in the synagogues. They're going to be brought to trial, and uh, they're going to, brother is going to be delivered over against brother, and children will rise up against their parents. And these are all things that we have seen through Christian history. These are all things. And I often joke, again, when people talk to me about the end times, about the tribulation, I say, you know, it's really easy for us to talk about tribulation living in America, but go to China right now. Go to the Sudan right now. Go to Iran right now and ask them their interpretation of the tribulation, right? I mean, there has been just cataclysmic events that have happened all through church history. And I think that's what Jesus is saying here is that, you know, when you look forward, there's this immediate oppression that's going to come from Rome, and they're going to crush the temple in Jerusalem because that's no longer necessary. And there's going to be this time later on where Jesus is going to come back. But in the middle, there's things that you got to expect. There's things that you got to have to understand are going to be part of of your life as a Christian, right? And the application for us is that we have to understand that our commitment to Christ is, is not about earthly success and earthly fulfillment because if you dedicate your life fully and solely, if you're totally committed to the cause of Christ and you're living out every moment in a way that glorifies Christ and to bring Him attention, you will not be successful in this world. That's what Jesus is telling us very clearly that there's a, a, a way that Christians are going to be treated through this church age, this age between the first and the second coming, that we just have to expect. And even though we live, we really do live in a really weird time in history as Americans where it's been pretty safe. But that has not been the Christian experience for, for most of history. And it's not the Christian experience for most of the world right now. Like I said a moment ago, we can go to different places and just see cataclysmic behavior towards Christians all over. And what Jesus is saying here is that if we are really, truly committed, and think about all the stuff we talked about in Mark moving forward, different visions of power, you know, different, different visions of earthly success, different visions of marriage, and all of these things that we've talked about in Mark. He says, if you are really, truly living this out, you should be so counter-cultural that it should be tangible. People should be able to see you because of your commitment to Christ. They should be able to see your values and your ethical decisions. They should see the way you handle your money. And, and, and I even talk about the simple things and how you treat the, the waiters and the, the, you know, the, the servants that we, we see in different places. That There should be such a marked and tangible difference in us that people will see that. And we have to understand that we may not live in this unique moment for very long that it can be very dangerous in many parts of the world to be a Christian right now. In fact, I heard someone, I was watching a lecture, it might have been the one we watched, uh, Mike and I watched the lecture this week, he said, the year of the highest number of Christian deaths in history was last year. The year of the second most highest 
number of Christian deaths was the year before that. The year of the third most highest, that's terrible language, I understand. The third highest number of Christian deaths was the year before that. Across the world, more people are dying right now than they did in the first century for their commitment to Christ. And Jesus is saying, this is what's coming. This, this is what he's prophesying. This is what he's turning to the future and telling us. And yeah, there's this event that happened in AD 70, and yeah, there's this event that's going to happen in the future, but man, there's this life that we're called to live now. And that's, to me, the point of all of the apocalyptic literature that we see in the scriptures is that no matter how bad things will get, you still have hope. That's the point. That's the point of all of it. Read Daniel in that lens. Read Revelation in that lens. Read this chapter in that lens, and you will see that's the thread that ties it all together, that no matter how difficult things will get, we still have hope. He's talking to a bunch of people, again, immediately, who spent their whole life revering the temple. These disciples were good Christian boys, and they had learned the Torah. They had gone to the temple to offer their sacrifices. They were still in awe of its beauty and the size of the stones. And he says, you know what? Before your generation passes, this thing is coming to the ground, but don't fear, right? Don't get, because they thought when the temple came down that the whole world was going to fall apart. And he says, this thing is going to happen, and it's going to be tough. Your life is going to be tough. You're going to be handed over. And we know that the original disciples all lost their head for Christ, and he's telling them, man, this, but don't be alarmed. You're going to see some stuff that's going to scare the fire out of you. But don't be alarmed. There's always hope. And so when I'm asked about my views of the end times, right, are you this, are you this? You know what? I say, it's really hard for me to come up with a singular view of the end times. And, you know, what is the agenda? What's the itinerary of, of Jesus coming back? When the whole point and the purpose was the writer encouraging Christians who are experiencing tremendous cataclysmic persecution. When John wrote Revelation, he's writing to a bunch of Christians under the time of Nero. Nero, for fun and for giggles, would take Christians and throw them up on a cross and light them on fire to, to, to light his pathway. That's the Christians that, Paul was, I mean, that John was writing to in the Revelation to say, take heart. Be hopeful that you, know, you might be experiencing things way beyond what you thought whenever you gave your life to Christ. Because, we, again, we live in this unique period in history where you hear people on TV saying, give your life to Christ, you're going to be healthy, wealthy, and wise, right? And sometimes we think that's where we're getting when we come to Christ. But most of history and what Jesus is telling us here is going to be quite the opposite. You've put a target on your back. You've now declared that you belong to another kingdom. And the, the, the reigning king has no part of that. And they're going to come after you. You need to take heart and be hopeful. And that's what we see here as I close. What are, what are the, I think, the things that tie... Mark 13 together are these just great exhortations. You know, there's this interwoven nature of immediate fulfillment, future fulfillment, and the fulfillment of in the between, but there's this steady kind of litany of exhortations. Stay awake. It's mentioned many times through Mark 13. Be alert, right? Don't be deceived. So there's going to be many who are going to come and deceive you. He says, you need to be awake and be alert. He says, it's like, you know, the manager who leaves, and he expects you to get your work done, but you don't know when he's going to come back. So be alert. Be awake. Don't fall asleep on your job. Don't fall asleep on what it is that God has called you to do. And don't be deceived. There's going to be lots of people who are going to come and tell you what the secret of life is. Right? I say that all the time. You just go to the supermarket aisle, and all these people have opinions about how you can live your best life now, and how you can be successful, and how you can get the most out of this, and how you can get the best whatever of that. All kinds of people are going to be telling you this, these relentless narratives of how you can be fruitful and get the most out of life. He says, don't be deceived, because none of that's true. The only thing that's true is that we have a Savior who has saved us by dying on the cross, and so why do we think our, our life is not going to be the same? He has called us to a cruciform life. The way that he came, defeated sin and death, was to offer his body as a living and holy sacrifice. And he says, now that's the way you're supposed to live. That's what you should expect. And in that, there's going to be trial and there's going to be difficulty. But stay awake, stay alert, and don't be deceived and have hope that I am coming back for you. I haven't forgotten you. That's the hardest thing. You know what? When I was a young preacher, I couldn't preach about suffering very much because I was a young preacher. I hadn't seen much, right? And now that we've been going through life and we've seen just our fair share of trials and struggles, and some of them don't compare to y'all's, but we have to understand how do we live 
in this world full of trial, tribulation, struggling, even adding to our trial by following Christ and still living in hope. If you can get that, if you can get that down, if you can dig in somehow into your faith and into these words of God, into the truths of God and realize that, man, there are things to be hopeful about. There's ways that we can be joyful in the middle of our trial. There's ways that we can experience the trials and the tribulations and even unto death. We might all have to give our life for Christ at some point. The reason why I say that is because it's happening in the world all over. Why wouldn't it happen to us someday? I don't know if it, it may not happen in our generation. I don't know. But Richard Phillips asked the question that the Christian faith is one that asks, are you willing to pay the price? And can you do it with hope? See, the hope is that Jesus is coming back. That's the point. You may have to endure for a while. You may have to struggle for a while. You may be on the losing side of the equation for a while. And for some of us, that while could be a long time. I get that. For some of us, our whole life could be marked by trial and suffering. I get that too. And we're wanting immediate gratification. We're wanting relief now. And the way that the Bible gives us our relief now is says, look to the future and believe. Look to the future and have hope that everything that you're experiencing now one day will be made right. One day that you're having to go through now will be given back to you. Everything that you have given up for the cause of Christ and his kingdom will be given back to you at some day. So take heart and hold on. Be awake. Do the work that you've been called to do. Continue to, to be a light to the nations. Continue to, to, to offer up the gospel. where It's the mechanism where people can be made right and have their sins atoned for. Be alert. Be awake. Do the work. Do not be deceived, but believe in your heart. Believe in your heart that it's worth it because Jesus is coming back. And the substance of our hope is that Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin for us by dying on the cross and ushering us into a completely new relationship with God where now we have the Holy Spirit that does comfort us that does give us peace, that does give us faith to hang on one more day for the cause of Jesus Christ. Because G and Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians that it, because Jesus died but then rose again, we can hang on. We can press forward. We can stay the course because we know it will be worth it and that he's coming back. That's the point. Of apocalyptic, I'm just going to say it to the end. And so as we have these last few moments, Mike's going to come and he's going to lead us through the Lord's Supper because we just want to take that opportunity to, again, to re-engage our hearts into the truth of the gospel so that we can be maybe strengthened and fortified and, and giving a new vision of hope that can get us through this life that Jesus prophesied that we will live. So let's turn it to Mike now. As you were preaching, um, a passage came to mind um, out of Luke. And so, uh, you know, one of the things that I thought about today as, I, as, as that verse came to mind was, you know, as we participate in the Lord's Supper and we take um, a, of the, the flesh and blood of Christ, this is something that we are participating with Christians 
across history for the last 2,000 years that all of these Christians have, have, have participated in this all the way back to these first uh, disciples here. And that, what, what an image just to think about, you know. Um, and it connects us, you know, th this talks about until is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. That one day we are all going to be in heaven eating together in the presence of Jesus. What a hope. You know, as, as Michael preached about today, we have a hope that transcends anything that we're going we're gonna to experience here. No, how, no matter how big, no matter how, how difficult. So I'm going to ask you to do something just a little bit strange today. And this is just something that I just feel compelled to do. Look around at each other for just a second. Like heads actually turning. Yeah. We're all, we're brothers and sisters in Christ, those of us that have accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior. And we are going to be in heaven one day together, participating in this feasting and uh, celebrating in the presence of Jesus. And so what, what an incredible opportunity that we have to begin to do a little bit of that part now with the Lord's Supper. So I would, um, as I ask our those helping us serve today to come forward, I'd ask you to take just a moment to just think and pray to prepare your hearts for what we're doing in taking the blood of Jesus, remembering that the blood of Jesus covers our sins, past, present, and future, that, that you would remember the sacrifice that by, uh, the body of Christ was broken. And just, is there anything, any sin in our lives we need to deal with now? And is there any, anything that, you know, relationally we need to fix among our brothers and sisters in Christ and just take a moment uh, to, to pray about that and then we're going to pray uh, here in just a moment before we start passing uh, our elements out so take just a moment to pray I'm going to ask Herman to pray for um, the body. Please bow with me. Lord, I just thank you so much, God, for your uh, continued love and your mercy. Lord, uh, thank you for this reminder, God, of uh, what you sacrificed for us. God, I just pray that uh, as we partake of the, the bread this morning, Lord, we just remember the, the flesh um, that you... Uh, sacrifice, Lord, for our sins. And God, I just pray that you uh, just bless this, Lord, and, and use us for your glory and your service and all that we do. And God, I just ask these things in your name.
1 Corinthians 11 gives us some instructions here and says, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. As we pre- prepare next to um, t- take uh, the take of the the juice, the the blood of Christ, I'm going to ask Frankie if he would pray for that element for us. First, thank you, Lord, for this yet another opportunity. Lord, praying that we humble ourselves in a manner as pleasing unto you, as we remember the sacrifice you made upon the cross. Because, Lord, it's by the shedding of your blood that covers our sins. And, Lord, it is so precious that we remember your precious gift that you gave to us, which is our way through you to eternity to spend with you. We praise you and we thank you for the shedding of your precious, precious blood. Amen. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Again, just uh, this is just such a great reminder again of the gospel that we get to uh, remember what Christ did for us. So let me pray and we'll be uh, dismissed um, from our great celebration of the Lord today. God, we thank you so much for the opportunity that we had to come and worship you. Uh, God, I pray that you would just draw us close together as a body of Christ. That God, as we go out, that we would live as people full of hope. That we would, our lives would reflect the hope that you have given us. And uh, God, in those times and when it's easy to be lulled to sleep, uh, God, that you would help us to be alert and remember what's most important, and that is your kingdom and um, showing people you and your love and your mercy and your grace, and it is available to all. Help us to live that out each and every day among our families and among um, our community. And God, we love you and put you in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a wonderful day.